Good afternoon. We are delighted to have you with us as we gather in this Lenten season. Today, as we look at the journey of the return and the whole of the call to return to the Lord, whose steadfast love and mercy endures forever, today we take a look at the return from false witnesses or from false witnessing. And we take a look at this in light of those that... Uh, that spoke against Jesus in terms of the false witness they bore to him, but also what is it to bear false witness against God? We don't often think in terms of that happening, but that's what it was, and the joy of knowing that we can return to him uh, who is a savior and who hears the false witness laid against him and is still there to save against all those uh, that still do. So with that, I invite you to begin, uh, join us as we together begin with our opening hymn, In the Cross of Christ, I Glory, number 427. <laughs> I invite you to rise as we continue with the order of service as will be projected above. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. In the day of my trouble, I call upon you. Let us make confession to our God, seeking his grace and forgiveness. Together as we sing stanza one. Merciful Lord, grant you pardon, forgiveness, and remission of 
all your sins. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Let your blessings be upon us, Heavenly Father, as we pass through these holy days in which we remember the sufferings and death of our Lord. And grant that as true and faithful witnesses, we follow him in willing obedience, learn his gracious humility, and be filled with his love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and gave himself for us. You may be seated as we continue with the first reading. The first reading is from the book of Leviticus. We read from the 24th chapter. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Bring out of the camp the one who cursed, and let all who heard him lay their hands on his head, and let all the congregation stone him. And speak to the people of Israel, saying, Whoever curses his God shall bear his sin. Whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him, the sojourner as well as the native. When he blasphemes the name shall be put to death. So far our first reading. We continue with the psalm. Teach me your way, O Lord. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries. For false witnesses are in his hands, and they have made real our hearts. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord. In the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The second reading for today, we read from the book of Acts, the 22nd chapter. And one Ananias, a devout man, according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me, and standing by me, said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour I received my sight and saw him. And he said, The God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. And now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. So far the second reading. We rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 26th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered. And Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest, and going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus, that they might put him to death. But they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last two came forward and said, This man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said so. But I tell you from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power, and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has uttered blasphemy. What further witnesses do we need? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? They answered, He deserves death. Then they spit in his face and struck him. 
And some slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Christ, who is it that struck you? This is the Gospel of the Lord. Deliver me, O Lord, my God, for you are the God of my salvation. In you, O Lord, do I put my trust. Leave me not, O Lord, my God. Deliver me, O Lord, my God, for you are the God of my salvation. Please be seated as we continue with the sermon hymn, Jesus Grant That Balm and Healing. We this afternoon will sing verses 1, 3, and 4. Grace, mercy, and peace to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. During the 1996 Summer Olympic Games in Atlanta, Eric Rudolph detonated pipe bombs in the Centennial Olympic Park. The blast killed one person and injured 111. It was the first of four bombings committed by Rudolph in 1996 and 97. Rudolph eluded capture for many years until finally he was arrested in North Carolina in 2003 and pled guilty. But before anyone knew anything of Eric Robert Rudolph, the FBI identified an Atlanta security guard named Richard Jewell as a person of interest, largely because he was something of a loner, a kind of sort of fit-the-profile lone bomber. And as with most all things media, they had a field day with this man, portraying Jewel as the, in the worst possible light, suggesting that as a failed law enforcement officer, he may have actually planted the bomb so he could find it and be hailed a hero. But as we know now, all this was pure false witness on many levels and in many ways. 
Once the dust settled, it was clear that Jewel was, in fact, a hero. He had spotted the suspicious backpack and alerted the appropriate authorities and helped clear the area of spectators in the 13 minutes or so before the bomb exploded. Without a doubt, the number of casualties was radically reduced because of Jewel's actions. Unfortunately, by the false witnesses that were shed again and again about this man and shared far and wide, the damage had been done to Jewel and his reputation. His name is forever connected with the Centennial Park bombing. And if you were to ask people two or three years later afterwards, who it was was the bomber, they would surely say it was Jewel and not the actual bomber. The power of false witness, power of a lie. The Eighth Commandment is simple. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. In our catechism classes, we may have well remembered that the substance of it is most likely understood is that we should not gossip, we should not tell lies. Bearing false witness most often has to do with the ways we talk about other people and how we use our mouths when it comes to others, their reputations, their actions, and their lives. This bearing false witness, of course, can also happen in court settings as well. But what about bearing false witness, giving false testimony, against God, or the Son of God. This is literally what blasphemy really is. It is what the young man in the first lesson for this evening, the Old Testament reading, is what he was stoned to death, stoned to death for doing. He was blaspheming God by saying untrue things about God and his actions. You see, blasphemy happens when anyone says untrue or false things about God or his works. And according to God's law, anyone found a, guilty of blasphemy is to be put to death. Blasphemy by false witness is exactly what's happening in the gospel lesson for today. Blasphemy against the Son of God. Our gospel takes place in a dark place. What makes the place dark is that the people of God, loving darkness rather than light, are mocking the God they claim to believe in by mocking his son, by blaspheming him to his face. You see, the Jewish leaders have already decided they have to put Jesus to death. He won't be reasoned with. He won't bend to their ways of thinking and their ways of religion. And he won't change in any way to accommodate their style of worship and running the world. Yet the only charge that they can use to put him to death is blasphemy. So the Jewish leaders are seeking, are actually hoping to find people who are willing to lie willing to bear false witness about Jesus, about the Son of God. Talk about blasphemy. As our text says, now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death. While this seems so wild, they are committed. They have committed themselves to doing whatever is necessary to save what they love most, and it ain't the Son of God. Let's think about this for a minute. They're actively looking for someone to offer lies, to offer false testimony under oath so that they can actually charge Jesus with blasphemy and thereby put him to death. In all of this, this blasphemy and what's happening here the most sadly ironic thing is that, as it was then and it still is today, most of those who are actually out there blaspheming God don't have the slightest idea they're doing it. When they begin to pontificate about what God is, how God is, or how he ought to be and how things ought to be, unaware that God will not be mocked as they are mocking Jesus. And as bad as this is, 
Matthew reveals, sadly, that it gets even worse. As he says, they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. People standing in line to lie about Jesus. But the text says they found none. Which means that none of the people and whatever they were saying about Jesus ever accused Jesus of blasphemy, of ever accused him of speaking a lie about God or falsely about God and his works. But then two come forward. And they try to bear false witness against Jesus simply by misquoting what he actually said, saying, he said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. When Jesus actually said, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Literally, you destroy this temple, and I will raise it up. Then the priest, chief priest, he comes after Jesus and wants him to respond. He wants him to respond to this. Even saying, you know, wanting him, you know, aren't you going to say something about this? Aren't, what do you have to say about what they're saying? But Jesus refuses. He remains silent which is the best response against any false witness is to not respond to it, to not dignify it, because the moment he takes up their false witness, their lie becomes the issue rather than the truth that Jesus is and brings to bear in the midst of the lies. Finally, the chief priest addresses Jesus directly, saying, I adjure you in by the living God, Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son, of the, the Son of God. Literally, I demand that you take an oath right now to speak the truth and tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. The hope, of course, is that Jesus will basically incriminate himself by saying, yeah, I am. And Jesus responds exactly how they want. He responds because it's an opportunity to speak the truth the truth that saves. You have said so, but I tell you from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest, of course, tears his robes, offended by what's happening, charging. He has uttered blasphemy. You have heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? And of course, they all declare he deserves death. They literally accuse Jesus of bearing false witness about God when he's actually speaking the truth about himself being the Son of God and that he will be seated at his right hand. Kind of sounds like the media today, doesn't it? But it's all in what they wanted. God has to be a liar if him, by, if him being a liar saves me. He who is the way to God, he who is the truth about God, he who is the life with God, is by false witnesses accused of bearing false witness against God. All to save themselves from the truth about God and the truth of God for them. So Jesus must now die. The interesting thing in all of this, and the reason why Jesus has to die, is to keep the lies alive their false testimony about God and themselves, to have this be the truth others will treat them by, to have this be the truth that others will handle and know and respect them by, Jesus has to die to let the lie live. And yet this is in fact the purpose of all gossip, false testimony, and lies. They're all used to save us from the truth. Not because the truth hurts, but because the truth will not guarantee us the outcome we want. These people actually believe that the death of Jesus will do that for them. So they, like we all too often, put their faith in a lie, in a false story, in false testimony about others, about Jesus, even about ourselves and our God. How often they forgot, and we yet today forget, that the gift of speech like the tongue that speaks what is in our hearts, was given to create, to build up, to bless, never to destroy, to hurt, to harm, to tear down, or to kill. 
by lies, by half-truths, by false testimony, by all that which is forbidden to us to speak against another and our God. And yet they, like we, use our tongue, use our lips, use the gift of speech as we might. It cannot save us from our sins and our responsibilities before the living God who sees all, knows all, and still has words to say. What do we return from? What do we seek to step back from? What do we turn to the Lord from? As the evil that is still within our hearts, yours and mine, even if it was in the hearts of the Jewish leaders on that dark night, don't we need to step back from the times when we weaponize our words and make war on the lives, the reputations, and the welfares of others? Oh, that wasn't my intent. Nobody's saying it was. But words wound. And contrary to the old adage, sticks and tones may break my bones, but names can never hurt me. We only still hear those names echoing on because the word was weaponized against us. All the while, whether it's spoken against us or we speak against others, totally unaware that we are actually bearing false witness against a child of God's creation, against a child for whom God has purchased by the blood of his Son, for Christ has died for all, whether we like them or not. They are still loved by him and indeed saved by that same blood. It is in this dark place of sinful liars that Jesus comes and allows himself to be lied about. Jesus allows false testimony to be laid against him from us all. He allows it to be laid upon him, brand him, stain him as a liar, as a blasphemer of God so that he might be condemned by lies and by false testimony to death, and there be damned as a liar for you and I, the liars, to there suffer the penalty for all of our lies, white, gray, or dark, black, though they may be. All this so that we might find a place to go as we return to our lies, to our false witness and find a Savior standing there with words written in his blood that we are forgiven of those words. Those words covered in his blood as he speaks new words in forgiveness, life, and salvation. So that we are forgiven for all of our lies by his words of truth and grace and mercy. Jesus then puts the power of all lies, all false testimony, all gossip. While he is laid and stained with these forever, he takes them into death by dying the death of a blasphemer and a liar. So that having taken them into death, they die too for us. And having risen on that th third day, having returned from lies and the power of lies and false testimonies, he comes and returns to speak greater words than a lie, greater truths about God than any blasphemy, as he offers words of forgiveness, of peace, and newness of life. Offering not just words, but offering himself in his own body and blood, given and shed for every word, spoken, misspoken, spoken so wrongly, so that we might hear that greater word, go in peace. Your words are forgiven. Yes, we now get to gladly return from our lives. I love that hymn, it always haunts me, where I can't think of the title of the hymn, but it says, keep me from saying words that need recalling. Yeah, we hope we, he sticks the shoe in our mouth before we say it. But thanks be to God that now in Jesus Christ we have one to go to when we have spoken those words. And he gladly is there to hear it. 
For as he died for those to whom we have spoken it, he was there to hear them for that person. But he's there to hear it also as the one who spoken, has spoken it, that we might be forgiven. The season of Lent is a time for us to examine ourselves and our words and to return to the Lord with all of our words by the words of forgiveness, hope, and invitation that through repentance and faith, there our words will be covered over by his words. And there we get to now live lives as those who bear the words of eternal life as we live by them. He makes us by his words to live by faith in his words of forgiveness, grace, and mercy. Words sealed upon us in our baptism. Indeed, united us to Jesus Christ, born of the words of eternal life that we still have and share. Words we need every day. Words of God's truth that will come overcome every lie. The testimony of God's word in a world that would testify against us. Words that would indeed bear witness that we are the children of God that when our own sins would say, by my words I surely have not been. All this we are given to say. You see, the words of God's truth that will always save those who let it have its full say. Yes, the law that accuses and condemns us for our words wrongly said, but yet that greater word of the gospel in Jesus Christ that always saves and always gives us new and better words that sets us free to use our tongues and our testimonies to share this good news sets us free to use our tongue and our testimony to speak well of others, to speak for those who cannot speak for themselves, to put the best construction on everything, and to put our tongue and our testimony before the throne of God in prayer for those who do not know how to pray and for those who are praying, even as the Holy Spirit uses his testimony before the Father for us. We live in a world where lies and false witnesses abound. But thanks be to God that you and I no longer have to live by them. As we live and believe in him who is the truth, speaks the truth at the right hand of God, and speaks it to us freely here each day. He who has the words of eternal life, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and you the blessed return to him. Amen. Now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you all. Amen. This time I invite you to rise as we sing our response together to the Lord. it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, hear my prayer. Lord God, in you we find the truth about our world and our lives. Spare us from the ravages of false witness. And when we fall, lift us up again, and lead us to Jesus, who is the truth of thy heart. 
That this we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. Faithful God, through the ancient prophets, you call us to return to you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. This we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. Loving God, the light of your love for us never dims. Yet, uh, as yet another day comes to a close and darkness falls. This we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. Ever present God, in the midst of this world fractured by sin, you bring wholeness and peace. And where we are experiencing turmoil, bring calm, bring us calm. This we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us bless the Lord. That the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You may be seated as we begin our closing hymn, and we will rise for the last as a doxological verse. things by uh, way of announcement. Our youth night is this next uh, Sunday at 6 p.m. It will be in person here at uh, Trinity at the building and we'll be gathering in the sanctuary. The youth will be gathering here to begin their evening uh, together of study and worship and indeed uh, fellowship together. Also uh, the soup donations, thanks for those who brought them. Please continue. We're going to be distributing these soon to the area food banks during this uh, Lenten season as well. Also, uh, LWML is coming there on Saturday, March 20th. They are hosting a prayer service here at Trinity. So look, uh, check your news and notes or look online for more information on that. Also, uh, please make sure to drop your offerings in the, or your, uh, your registration cards if you have them, in the offering boxes as you leave. And lastly, would you please, we could use a few volunteers to help us wipe down the pews for uh, the 7 o'clock service that will be coming in so that things are uh, 
safe and uh, secure for them as well. With that, God's blessings on your evening. Enjoy the little nice weather we have left before the rains come, but uh, God bless your evening. Thank you.